are interested in it. Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Pratt, president of the Sherman Foundation, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to Philanthropy New York. On behalf of the board members of Philanthropy New York, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this morning's program social, environmental, and economic resiliency follow-up to the Puerto Rico Learning Tour, brought to you in collaboration with the Environmental Grant Makers Association and Neighborhood Funders Group. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Leticia Paguero, Executive Director of the Andrus Family Fund, to lead today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Really excited to be here today. Um, and before we start our formal discussion, I'd love to go around the room just very quickly and get a sense of who's in the room um, before I pass it over to Janice to set context for us for our discussion. So I'll model and start. Um, my name is Leticia Peguero. I'm the Executive Director of the Andrus Family Fund and Andrus Family Philanthropy Program. So maybe we can go around the room this way. Program officer at the New York Foundation. I'm Joshua Cohen with the Environmental Grant Makers Association. I'm Adam Leibowitz, Food and Environment Program Officer at North Star Fund. Uh, Lizette Munoz, I'm an engineer at Puerto Rico Federal Affairs Administration. Good morning. I'm Sol Marie Alfonso Jones, Senior Program Officer of the Long Island Community Foundation. Good morning. My name is Brenda Torres Barreto. I'm Director of the Puerto Rico Federal Affairs Administra Administration, the regional office which is based here in, in New York City. I'm still Mike Pratt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rachel Leon with the Environmental Grant Makers Association. I'm Jerry Maldonado. I'm a Senior Program Officer at Ford. I'm Jose Garcia, Program Officer at Serna Foundation. Good morning, I'm Janice Petrovich. I'm a trustee of the Miranda Foundation and also a consultant to philanthropy and international NGOs based in Puerto Rico. Larry Shapiro with the Rockefeller Family Fund here in New York. Elizabeth Guernsey, Program Officer with Open Society Foundations. Olivia Armenta, Associate Director of Hunter Resiliency. Thank you, everyone. So in a second, I'm going to pass it over to Janice to set context for us. But I wanted to just give folks a lay of the land of how we're, our discussion will, um, will take place today. So Janice is going to set a little context for us, give us an intro. And then we're going to have our great panelists talk a little bit about their work in Puerto Rico. So both um, the, you know, their individual foundation's perspective, but also within the context of the current economic situation that Puerto Rico finds itself in. And then we're going to have respondents. So Jose Garcia, Jerry Maldonado, Arturo Garcia, and Nelson Colón will respond um, to what they heard. So with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Janice to set some context for us and give us a little bit of an umbrella in a, in a 30,000 foot overview of what's happening on the Very island. Good. Thank you. In my uh, few minutes, uh, I hope to give you some very quick facts about Puerto Rico, its nonprofit and foundation sectors. Um, I, since my time is limited, I hope my remarks raise questions that we can later address in the discussion. As you know, Puerto Rico has been in the news of late. Um, our economic crisis has, has attracted a lot of media attention, and some are comparing Puerto Rico's crisis to Detroit's. <coughs> like Detroit, we've been losing jobs and we've been losing population. Our economy has been contracting for the last 10 years. Our labor force participation rate is at 40%, which is the lowest in the nation. Approximately 50,000 Puerto Ricans leave the island each year. And the 2010 census reflected this decline in population. Actually, it is the first decline since the census data have begun to uh, been collected in Puerto Rico. We owe our creditors more than we can figure out how to pay. 
uh, our bonds have been downgraded to junk status. And like Detroit, abandoned properties abound in every type of neighborhood. We are though clearly very different from Detroit, starting with our language and our history. As many of you are aware, Puerto Ricans on the island can and do serve in the US military in significant numbers, but we cannot vote for president when we reside on the island, nor do we have voting representation in Congress. Because of our political relationship in the, uh, with the United States, the island government is not allowed to declare bankruptcy, uh, which limits the ways in which we can deal with our huge debt. Important federal programs provide fewer funds to the island. Many are either capped or apply under different formulas. Our poverty rate is 45%. That and the level of income inequality is higher than in any of the 50 states. The government is now publicly admitting that the economy is running because about 25% of the economy is fueled by underground and informal economic activity. They wouldn't admit that before, but now they do. And uh, also remember that any government data tends to be smaller than the reality. Uh, suffice it to say that even as it seems um, that Detroit is beginning to pull out of its crisis, things are bad and not getting any better in Puerto Rico. What is the government doing? Well, similar to Greece and Argentina, the government is trying to rein in government expenditures, increase the taxes, and negotiate with its bondholders. As you can expect, the economic contraction and the new taxes have the most negative impact on the most vulnerable. Puerto Rico's economic growth model was based on manufacturing and providing tax incentives and other benefits to corporations. We now compete with many other countries that are doing the same and that have lower labor costs. No new economic development plans have been put forth by the government. Instead, the government has instituted a mishmash of initiatives with unclear impact on economic growth. For example, a series of laws have been passed to encourage millionaires to live in Puerto Rico with enormously beneficial tax incentives. Government officials are selling Puerto Rico as a new tax haven, comparing it to Singapore and the Cayman Islands. There are no requirements for these millionaires to invest in the island, although some who have taken residence have bought multi-million dollar houses, hotels, and beachfront properties, raising the real estate value of high-end properties. Efforts are also being made to increase tourism, but real job creation is simply not happening. What about the nonprofit sector? There are thousands of nonprofits in Puerto Rico. There's a new report that will come out in a month or two. When the Neighborhood Funders Group and the Environmental Funders visited Puerto Rico last fall, they had a chance to see a few of our most interesting nonprofits. Our nonprofit leaders are among the most creative, interesting, and productive members of our society. They work outside of the party system, which is a real benefit in Puerto Rico. Nonprofits are working to improve our environment, save our forests and coasts, increase governmental transparency and accountability, to improve education, bring arts to schools, and enhance the arts and strengthen the arts. As in the US, nonprofits do a lot with a little. In Puerto Rico, they are now having to do more with less. Interesting uh, recent examples of nonprofit actions include legally forcing the government to release a report on tax reform that they commissioned to KPMG. The government didn't want to release it. Uh, the uh, nonprofits uh, forced the government through a mandamus to do that. Once made available, groups such as the Center for the New Economy and the Center for Investigative Journalism have been providing analyses and opinions to engage the public. Women's organizations were able recently to successfully advocate for a new law that requires public schools to incorporate a gender perspective in their curriculum. And the environmental group Corredor Ecologico del Noreste has achieved a new partnership with the Puerto Rico Natural Resources Department to jointly protect the coast and, pro and protect turtle nesting places. So this is an example of a government nonprofit partnership. Finally, a word on Puerto Rico's foundation sector. While there are many foundations operating in Puerto Rico, there is really just a handful that make grants to nonprofit organizations. Altogether, they make about $25 million uh, in grants a year. 
And this might be a small sum compared to some of your budgets, but it goes a long way on the island because of the talent and commitment of our grantees. Puerto Rico foundations are eager to partner with those in the United States. As you know, US-based foundations have res responded robustly to Detroit's economic crisis as they did in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, but they have been largely absent from Puerto Rico. Funding to Puerto Rico by US-based foundations largely disappeared over the past 10 years. Even though Puerto Rico should be included in US portfolios, program staff have reported that they typically have to make the case to recommend grants in Puerto Rico. Recently, we're seeing the beginning of a turnaround with a significant investment by Open Societies and the beginning of a, also a significant, hopefully, investment by the Ford Foundation. And I know some of you around the table and those who visited Puerto Rico recently are also contemplating making grants. And we're not entirely clear how it is that Puerto Rico uh, fell off the map, but we're uh, trying to get it back on the map. And my presence here today is an effort to continue this dialogue that we've begun and to encourage you to get to know Puerto Rico and its nonprofit sector and to invest in the future of the island. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. So let's start with Olivia and 100 Resilient Cities. So each of the panelists will have about seven minutes to tell us um, about their work. So Olivia, you're the Associate Director for 100 Resilient Cities, and San Juan has been chosen as one of, one of those cities. Um, can you give us a brief description of the work and how, how did the 100 Resilient Cities portfolio come about sure. in, in, uh, to the Rockefeller Foundation? And then tell us why Puerto Rico. Sure. Right? So I'm sure that there's a, a really varied array of cities in there from all over the world, and so we'd love to hear why Puerto Rico. And then I know that you were just there, so I'm very jealous about that. Um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about how Puerto Rico has decided to, to, um, to define resiliency for themselves. Sure. So um, just to give a, an idea about the initiative, um, it's a $100 million initiative that was launched by the Rockefeller Foundation. And the idea really there was to catalyze um, resiliency across the globe. And so this was looking at uh, economic, social, physical resiliency and the idea then was was to have 100 cities participate in this initiative. So right now we have 67 cities. We have had two rounds, and so San Juan uh, became a member during the, the second round. And so this was an opportunity last week for me to go down there for the first time and, and meet with uh, the municipality in, in San Juan. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, but just to give a, a broader picture of, of what we're trying to do. Um, so one, it's this idea of catalyzing resiliency and foster new thinking and how to kind of integrate different parts of that, so social, physical, environmental, economic. Um, and then also we're trying to grow the market for resiliency. Um, how do we catalyze new thinking in the private sector to, to look at these resiliency challenges? So maybe, first of all, it's helpful just to talk about what how do we define resiliency. And what we're thinking about is the capacity of individuals, institutions, um, communities to not only survive but to really adapt and grow. So, like, if we're on a, if the trajectory were a straight line up, we would hope that these shocks and stresses that that hit communities would allow them to catapult themselves to to another level. And, and really, how do we use these acute shocks and stresses to to be an opportunity to catalyze change and thinking? So. In that sense, we really view San Juan as a, a very ripe environment for, for new thinking because the municipality has defined um, acute shocks and stresses as, as being the, the hurricanes, the earthquakes, um, the economic situation of the island, uh, decaying infrastructure, especially the transportation sector. And we spoke with Mary Yulene for two hours, so she was. Uh, really palpably engaged, very excited, and really off the top of her head could name the, the acute shocks and stresses that she believes San Juan faces. So again, it was it was in that realm that we're looking at kind of the acute shocks and then stresses. We see a declining population, an aging population, um, a brain drain of, of a lot of uh, economic the economic workforce of, of Puerto Rico. So. In discussing that, we also discussed kind of what we wanted to bring to the table, and this is really the core offerings that we're bringing at the, as a, the initiative of 100 resilient cities. So 
we're looking at placing somebody, a chief resilience officer in municipal government. And this person is to have a transversal, like cross-cutting look at, at how to leverage different sectors to, to integrate thinking. And a lot of times this can be even more cost efficient than, so, so what I want to say is it doesn't necessarily imply huge um, investments of money in terms of, of how the city has to be thinking about things, but can, there can be co-benefits in terms of integrating um, thinking across the municipality. So we were very, very interested in this chief resiliency officer um, and how, what this person can do within city government to, to look across.
where that overlap is mm -hmm. and so where co benefits can be. And so I think that really speaks to mm -hmm. the economic, uh, mm -hmm. the economic yeah. challenges because the idea I think in, in a few scenarios is we could possibly find solutions that overlap and even create mm -hmm. um, multiple benefits. Mm -hmm. um, I want to kind of bring that home a little bit in terms of examples so it doesn't seem so abstract, but um, sometimes this looks like uh, mm -hmm. the integration of for example, the lack subsidies are really lacking in in public infrastructure in vulnerable communities, and some cities are kind of grappling with like, how do we then create public space? But oh, we also know that this is an area that um, is prone to flooding. So mm -hmm. how do how can this public space also capture floodwaters? And how can we think about replenishing the aquifer? Mm. And also, we have the challenge of not having fresh water in this community. So can we capture it and filter it? So just kind of layering these different ideas mm -hmm. where across sectors that might be might have been the water department and the public parks mm -hmm. department. And so how are you integrating thinking mm -hmm. kind of across mm -hmm. the sectors? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to move um, on to Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, I know that Puerto Rico is one of the Open Places Initiatives uh, cities. So my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that there are three. There's San Diego, Buffalo, and Puerto Rico. So can you tell us a little bit about the Open Places Initiative? And again, how did that come to be at Open Society? And, and why Puerto Rico is one of the three? I know that the work on the island, and you'll talk more about this, is focusing on building capacity and, and promoting democratic practice. And I know when we spoke on the phone in preparation for this, there was a lot of conversation about how Puerto Rico's colonial status um, impacts the idea of talking about democracy and what transparency around democratic practices look like. So would love to hear your thoughts on how it came to be at Open Society and then a little bit about the, the Open Faces Initiative. Um, great. So as Leticia mentioned, the Open Places Initiative is um, an investment by Open Society Foundations um, in Buffalo, San Diego, and Puerto Rico. Um, we initially launched this initiative as a way for Open um, Society to think more about what it means to be investing in place locally. Given the challenges, um, we know that low-income and communities and communities of color face in terms of access to political, economic, and civic opportunities. Um, so we're very interested in this idea, as Janice mentioned, around um, promoting civic capacity and democratic practice. I um, joined the foundation in December, and so I've been getting a lot of um, uh, good learning around civic capacity, and I'm often like, how do we define it? So the way we've been thinking about it is really the work across sectors that accelerates um, progressive change that is both significant and sustainable, especially thinking about um, uh, reducing barriers and, and obstacles that marginalized populations face in, um, decision, in decisions that are made and how they um, work sort of in the civic infrastructure of where they are. Um, you know, our founder believes a lot in the power of place and that change happens um, at the local level. So while OSF and U.S. programs has historically made lots of investments in local places, it's often been around advancing a national campaign. Um, and so this is really um, a new um, way for open places to really be investing in the place for the sake of the place and thinking about what the challenges and opportunities are in those places. Um, so we launched the Open Places Initiative in, in 2013. We reached out to 16 municipalities who then applied for a planning grant, and we awarded eight planning gra grants in 2013. And then out of that year of working with sites across the country, we chose our three sites, Buffalo, San Diego, and Puerto Rico. We've committed um, funding at a million dollars a year for three years, and we are committed to being in each place for up to 10, because we know that the kind of change that we're looking to achieve is going to take time. Um, we have sort of three components to our theory of change in, in these places. So the first is that we've left it up to the site to think about what issues they want to address. So in San Diego, their, one of their main goals is around the criminal justice system and reentry. Um, uh, Buffalo is very interested in, in workforce development, high road jobs, and I'll, and I'll talk about what the Puerto Rico is, our site in Puerto Rico is working on. Um, the second is that in all of the issue areas that the sites are addressing, we really want this civic capacity um, um, 
advancements of the capacities to be inherent in all those. So maybe that means bringing in more partners to the industry. Maybe that means thinking about how data is used in place um, or expanding data since lack of data. Um, and then third, we've left it up to the site in terms of how they want to structure it. So if they want to create a new organization that brings in a lot of partners, that's great. If they want to work in sort of an intermediary way, um, we're fine with that too. So we, these are sort of the broad parameters we've laid out. We have um, required that each site has a board and has sort of clear governance. Um, and we've been really pushing our sites to think about how they expand their boards beyond the core partners. So they bring in business, government, philanthropy. Um, and so we're excited about the, the strides they made in that last year. And then lastly, um, we've let all of the sites choose um, what geography they want to work in, which has actually been quite interesting in terms of our learning across sites. Um, Buffalo has chosen to focus on the city. San Diego has chosen to focus on the county. And Puerto Rico has chosen to focus on the whole island. So um, this is made for a really fun assessment, <laughs> right? It's made for a really um, fun way to learn across but learn across sites, but we're really excited about what we can learn um, in our work in Puerto Rico. So as most of you know, um, we, the Center for the New Economy, who I know most of you are familiar with, are, is the fiscal sponsor for the Open Places Initiative, and they are actually the group that applied, um, applied for the Open Places Initiative. Um, Espacios Abiertos is the group that sort of spun out of CNE that is now um, uh, sort of executing the Open Places Initiative. So far, um, Associates Abiertos has engaged about 15 partner organizations, and they're constantly working on bringing in more, um, more groups across the island. Um, 2014, I think, I know folks were down, I think, in November, we're down there. Um, 2014, I think, turned out to be a, a much larger planning year than we thought, but not surprising, given that it's a, you know, a complicated place-based strategy. Um, and I think it also goes to the lesson that it's, uh, it takes time to build trust among partners, and I think that that's, we're seeing that in our sites, but especially in Puerto Rico. Um, so let me talk quickly just about the goals that um, that Asocios Abiertos is, is working on. First is um, access to justice. Um, they're working, their core partners here at ACLU and the University of Puerto Rico Law School's um, clinic. Um, and this is really thinking about um, helping um, Puerto Ricans know about their, act, their, their rights and their access to legal information and, and their right to representation with an explicit focus on, on vulnerable um, Puerto Ricans. They focused this year, 2015, um, on educating legal leaders and the general public about the legal resources and their rights. And they've set a long-term goal to have one million Puerto Ricans aware of the legal rights and their access to legal services. Um, recently, they they launched a website, which is very exciting, that has um, sort of amazing amount of information sort of for any legal situation you may find yourself in. And they're working to build out that website so that it can also be a resource for people to go to to access um, pro bono legal counsel. Um, and they're working with law firms and other <clears throat> clinics to try to expand the number of partners they have in that engagement. And um, they've also um, have these Know Your Rights videos that they've mm -hmm. been producing and putting out on their website. Um, which are really exciting, and they'll continue that outreach this year. Second, the second goal that Associates Abiertos is advancing is around in economic security. They've been um, very um, Center for New Economy and, and Associates Abiertos have been very um, involved in the tax reform conversations that have been going on in Puerto Rico. And Associates Abiertos has been speaking a lot about advocating for earned income tax credit, which, as you know, does not exist um, in Puerto Rico. And they're also going to spend this time thinking this year in and in response to Janice's, 40% of the um, folks being involved in the workforce thinking about um, how to craft a workforce strategy for us. And the last area is around government accountability and transparency. So um, we're really lucky to have the Center for Investigative Journalism as one of the core partners there. Um, obviously, folks are aware of some of the issues around lack of transparency and, and lack of the FOIA law in Puerto Rico. Um, and so Asasio Zerriarichos is really going to use um, 2015 and, and looking towards 2016 to think about pushing for a transparency law and also just thinking about thinking, talking about transparency principles in terms of leading up to the 2016 elections in terms of thinking about candidates and and folks that um, that sort of share these values um, in the very C3 context. Sorry, I shouldn't have said use the word candidates, right? Um, and then lastly, I think the really exciting thing that we um, that we work with the Sausage Abiertos this year was that we convened about 30 journalists in Puerto Rico with EA partners and OSF staff 
um, to talk about the strategies that journalists can use to sort of push for transparency. Um, this already has led to a bunch of editorials and um, a lawsuit demanding that the government provide greater access to information. Um, uh, I'll talk a quickly about the mm -hmm. Y Puerto Rico, but I also would just like mm -hmm. to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned this year. So I think um, the, the lack of transparency, um, you know, I think creates challenges in terms of how you build civic infrastructure on the island. And I think that, you know, um, some, some, you know, there's some challenges in terms of getting education data or other types of data. And that's something that the um, Sosa Xavier Trust is interested in, in terms of how you kind of can use that um, information to help um, promote these civic capacities. Um, the last, um, you know, I think um, Jenna's talked about nonprofit partners and, and there's so many amazing nonprofit partners on the island, but um, we've seen that so many of them are, their sole source of funding is government funding. And so that mm -hmm. makes for a challenge in terms of um, building and bringing in partners, because if you're concerned that your funding is primarily coming from the government, that can be challenging in terms of maybe not always being in exactly the same um, line of thinking. Um, and then that also means there's just less folks who are doing the civic capacity type work. Um, and then, um, you know, we're all aware of this domestic, not domestic, not international mm -hmm. challenge. Mm -hmm. um, one way that we've um, sort of worked on that at OSF is that we've tried to make connections with the for us also say we are close with some of our US programs partners. So we have a journalism portfolio within um, our democracy fund. And so they fund a lot of investigative journalism in the United States. And so we've tried to make some connections there for for us also say um, And um, I think the other challenge we see here is that the lack of data and just the lack of um, Puerto Rico being captured in a lot of our national data sets um, mm -hmm. has been um, a challenge again to learn some on data person is like coming back to them. Um, but on a happy note, um, I think that we've been really um, impressed by how much talent um, and opportunity there is on the island. We were excited to get into Puerto Rico, I think, because of both the opportunities and the challenges that we've, we've seen. Um, and we are really excited about how this investment could um, maybe bring foundation chairs to the table. <laughs> um, I, I would say um, I think some of the work that EA is investing in, especially around transparency and access to justice, um, is really something that will um, benefit lots of people on the island given the challenges and opportunities Puerto Rico faces in this moment. So um, we're happy to talk about our work and we really hope that others will join us in it. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so last but not least, Larry. Um, so Larry Shapiro is the Associate Director uh, for Program Development at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Family and fund. Family Fund, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Nobody's ever made that mistake. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. Um, so, you know, I'd love to talk about philanthropy for, for an interconnected world, right? And which, you know, it seems to be perfect as we're talking about Puerto Rico, where a good portion of the population, right, is part of the Puerto Rican diaspora, of which many of us here in this room are a part of. Um, so, Larry, can you tell us a little bit about your work in Puerto Rico? And I know that you funded Puente here, um, which is based in New York City. So tell us a little bit about your work and maybe help us understand how this idea of interconnectedness, right, philanthropy for, for, for Puerto Rico, under the umbrella of this idea of interconnection, how do we connect some of the work that you're doing um, here, both here with El Puente and the Puerto Rican diaspora with what's happening on the island? Okay, well, I'll try, thanks. <laughs> um, so uh, Rockefeller Family Fund is an entire, all right, first of all, we're not that big, even though we have the Rockefeller name, we're <laughs> maybe 1% the size of the now, no longer here Rockefeller Foundation, uh, <laughs> but we try hard. And uh, we're entirely domestic, but I'm glad to say that our board seems to define domestic as including um, commonwealths associated with the United States. Um, and uh, we've tended to be pretty activist over the years. And for the last 10 years or so, our environmental program has been entirely focused on climate change. And just um, as to how we got into Puerto Rico and what that even means for us and how that I think I hope connects to some other things I'll go through that a little bit is so I've worked closely with El Puente in a number of capacities for probably 
25 years or so. And in fact, that's how I first met Brenda when she was working mm -hmm. at El Puente and was a, a critically important part in uh, helping come up with the uh, project that we're now engaged in. And so during much of that 25 years, I've been steaming together with Luis Gardner Costa, who was the uh, founder and CEO and kind of guiding spirit of El Puente. And um, in discussions after the uh, failure of the climate bill in Congress in 2010, we started thinking about, well, it's all well and good that uh, we had the, the support uh, for that bill of very well-educated, white, liberal, secular environmentalists, and I like that demographic category, I, I say, <laughs> but it's really not good enough to get something big done in the United States. And in order to have any hope of getting something big done, you have to have leadership coming from lots and lots of different places that aren't always, uh, or sometimes aren't at all in the game. And I think it has often been the case, not always, but often unfortunately been the case that um, environmental leadership has engaged with uh, people of color in a kind of transactional way, uh, asking people more or less to be short-term junior coalition partners as opposed to true participants in the development of either policy or strategy. And even setting aside whether that's right, and I would say it's wrong, it's also just plain not very smart because people don't stay for the long term if you're going to do it that way. And so in thinking about all of this, we started looking at some demography issues. And it occurred to us that although Puerto Ricans had not been in a leadership role on climate change issues in the United States, they matter a lot, or at least they can matter a lot politically uh, in the United States. And I think Americans in general don't know that. I think even Puerto Ricans probably don't know that, basically. And I think certainly the climate funders, who are overwhelmingly based in California, don't know it. They don't even know Puerto Ricans, because there just aren't that many Puerto Ricans in California. And so you know, when you have this conversation with them, it's, um, I, I, I wish I would, had been, could report here, I've been incredibly successful at having these conversations with some of those climate funders. But I would say that's not quite the case yet, but we'll see. Um, but so what we uh, came to realize was that as much as for those of us in New York, who of course all think New York is the center of the universe, and in some sense the center of the Puerto Rican universe, <laughs> um, and New York is still the state with the largest Puerto Rican uh, population in the United States, but Florida is second and gaining every day. There, uh, are now, the, the estimate uh, as of this year is it's now surpassed a million Puerto Ricans in Florida. And of course, unlike every other Latino group that comes to the mainland US, everybody's a citizen, so everybody can vote immediately. Um, and so, um, and we don't have to go through all the reasons why Florida is arguably the most important state politically in the United States, but it obviously is. And to the extent to which Puerto Ricans <laughs> decide to be vocal about particular issues. And of course, the Puerto Rican diaspora is, in many circumstances, as concerned and maybe even more concerned kind of with what happens back home than they are with what happens wherever it is they happen to be. Uh, there is, at least I think, and uh, the thinking of El Puente was this way too, the opportunity to really engage people with climate change issues and play a leadership role on that. Um, but in order to do that, in order to do that, um, first, climate change has to be viewed as a serious issue in Puerto Rico. And with all of the problems Puerto Rico faces, um, much of, much like most of the United States, really, yeah, it's an issue, you know, but it's not necessarily a top tier issue uh, like uh, bankruptcy or crime or jobs or all sorts of things are top tier issues. And so, um, we felt that in order to have some hope of really getting anything done in Florida, it's important to start in Puerto Rico. Um, and just to go through some things that people probably know, so I'll go through it quickly. Puerto Rico is small. If Puerto Rico it reduced its emissions of greenhouse gases to zero, it would make pretty much diff no difference globally. Be a good thing. I'm not saying it's not a good thing. <laughs> they should try to reduce it. It's terrible that they have an electric system based on oil. But still, 
Um, in the overall scheme of things, Puerto Rico is a small place. And but because the United States is a big and powerful place. And so therefore, to the extent to which Puerto Ricans, especially in the US, uh, can turn things around or help turn things around in the US, Puerto Ricans can be, I think, tremendously important. Um, Puerto Rico as an island uh, faces rising sea level, more hurricanes, worse hurricanes, mosquito-borne diseases as they move north, all of the various calamities associated with climate change and faces them in ways that are more substantial than much of the continental U.S., although not necessarily all of the continental U.S. And so we decided we should try to have a big event in Puerto Rico uh, called an, an Encuentro, and I speak absolutely no Spanish. And so, um, but even when people are talking about this event in English, they always call it an Encuentro. So I assume <laughs> there's no good English translation exactly for that Gathering. for that word. And in fact, when when we first went to Puerto Rico uh, in planning this, and with Brendan and Luis and I went, and Luis says, "Well, you know, you got to come." And I said, "Well, you know, I'll come, but I, can't, I don't even think I know how to count to ten in Spanish." And he says, "Well." You, that's not the point. You represent the Rockefellers. Said, oh, good point. Okay, I'll go. And so I did. So, so I'm there like in my symbolic role in a way. And, um, and, um, and uh, Luis and Brenda, um, you know, first thing that happened, actually, they picked me up at the airport. airport. They had already had their first meeting with the Archbishop of San Juan and said, good, good news, he's decided to sponsor the Encuentro. So I thought, well, that's cool. You know, you don't have a lot of archbishops in the continental U.S. in sponsoring major climate meetings. In fact, as far as I can remember, the number is zero. And so, um, so, and then, of course, because the archbishop sponsored it, then the leaders of all of the Protestant denominations decided that, well, they all had to be co-sponsors because you can't <laughs> let your competitors get out ahead of you. And so, so we had this amazing event with the leaders of uh, really every important sector in Puerto Rican society, political, the governor, the former governor, the mayor of uh, San Juan, labor leaders, business leaders, the religious leaders, and the then newly elected governor issued five executive orders that were really what environmentalists in Puerto Rico had been hoping would happen for years and years and years. And I don't mean to say everything's wonderful. There are all sorts of difficult implementation issues associated with those executive orders, but it was pretty important. Um, we unfortunately lost Brenda to the, the government, but, uh, but um, so there were some uh, personnel issues that we had to uh, solve over time. But I think that there's a good coalition and a good network that has developed through the name uh, uh, Latino Climate Action Network in Puerto Rico that has really uh, moved forward in Puerto Rico. And the work has now started in a pretty serious way in Florida where um, uh, there has been now substantial engagement of uh, clergy leadership. Uh, Luis's idea, which I think is sensible, is that it's very useful to try to ground this sort of thing in religious leadership, especially in communities that are religious. Um, what, a, what an insight, you know. But, um, but not the way most of the secular environmental movement in the United States actually does things most of the time. And, um, and so we'll see. But I think that um, listening to some of what was discussed here, which was uh, not really about climate change, I do think that the power, or at least the potential power, of the Puerto Rican diaspora, especially in Florida, is huge. And um, it's something that has not yet been really mobilized, as far as I'm able to tell, mm -hmm. around issues that uh, affect Puerto Rico. The power of, of uh, Puerto Ricans in Florida is, or at least their numbers are getting larger and larger. And it seems like there's a good chance that its power could get larger and larger. And if you look at, I don't think these are perfect analogies at all, but I would mention them for people to think a little bit about as to how well these analogies work. If you look at the way European immigrant communities and their children and grandchildren have affected U.S. policy as it relates to um, uh, their relatives, wherever their relatives might be, whether that's in Ireland or in Italy or, or um, Jews both at one point in time in Europe and more recently in Israel, those communities have been extremely important in 
affecting U.S. policy. And I think that opportunity is there for Puerto Ricans, largely through the luck of the draw, just because they happen to be in Florida, really, as opposed to being in any number of other places where they could be, they could be that frankly wouldn't matter all that much politically. And so I think it's something to think about. And when people are thinking about how should foundation money be invested, I think investing some portion of it in the continental US in places that matter politically, I think is really worth, uh, worth considering. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we are going to move um, to our respondents. And I was told that our respondents, need, we need to switch um, seats because of the mics <laughs> so that our live stream uh, is heard. So we'll, maybe we'll take a, a minute to have Jose, Jerry, Nelson, and Arturo come up um, to the podium or to the table. <laughs> Not exactly a podium. <laughs> ready? Yes. All right. So I am going to pass it on to our respondents in a second. I um, just wanted to sort of throw out a couple of questions for us to think about both as the, as the respondents are talking and then hopefully for a good discussion afterwards. And one was we, we heard a lot about these different funder initiatives that are happening on the island. Um, and so would love for us to, to have somewhere in, in our minds, you know, how, how do we create an infrastructure that allow the funders to work um, collaboratively, right? This idea of collaborative, um, not necessarily collaborative funding, but just thinking through, you know, what are the what is the infrastructure that's needed, if any at all, to allow funders and affinity groups, right, to be able to work collaboratively on the island, especially um, as we take into account Janice's wonderful context setting for us and understanding the gravity of the situation on the island. Um, and then the other question, I think, or, or thought for me as someone that's part of the Puerto Rican diaspora here in New York is always the, the colonial um, status of the island and how that impacts um, both it's limbo status, right? So national American funders say it's not part of the U.S., and then the international funders say it's not international. And so, just you know, having that as as background information or some context for us as we as, as we listen to the responders, I think would be really great. So, I'm going to pass this over to Arturo Garcia Costa, who's a program officer at the New York Community Trust. Thank you, Patricia. Um, well, I, I thought that the presentations this morning were were excellent, and um, I had the, the, the honor and, and um, pleasure of going on the learning tour that the Neighborhood Funders Group and uh, Environmental Grammar Association did uh, in December. And I can tell you, one of the things I took away from that experience was uh, the incredible potential on the island and the powerful need. And I think that the, the remarks that Janice made this morning sort of spoke to the need, and we can, we can drill down. Uh, what the results of that mac macroeconomic situation is, what the results of that kind of brain drain, that kind of, of, uh, of talent leaving the island. Because think about the people that are leaving the island. They're oftentimes the people that are bilingual. They're oftentimes the people that, by their very nature, by the fact they're leaving the island, are entrepreneurial and are, are willing to take risks. So that those sorts of intangible impacts are important to understand. Um, in that trip from Vieques to San Juan Harbor to the beautiful mountain forest of Juntas, um, I was impressed with the creativity, passion, and effectiveness of the community leaders that we met. And it, really, that's the kind of a fertile ground that philanthropic dollars can really help to build and to, to 
to nurture. And, um, you know, we were talking about resilience this morning, and Larry talked a little bit about um, climate change. Truthfully, there's been two shocks that the decision, the ill-advised decision by Congress to, to eliminate the federal tax break in a very abrupt manner in 2000, over between 2004 and 2006, and the 2008 recession. Uh, and those two shots really have shown and revealed the vulnerabilities of the island, many of the vulnerabilities of the island. And, um, and I think that addressing those vulnerabilities is one of the roles that these civil society leaders, these community leaders, can really help to do that the government is not going to be able to do by itself. It, you need to have a nonprofit sector. You need to have civil society fully engaged on addressing these uh, vulnerabilities. So, as just, Leticia just alluded to, um, I think U.S. foundations have to stop hemming and hawing um, about grant making to Puerto Rico and this, and the other um, uh, territories, island territories and worrying about that status. For the foreseeable future, Puerto Rico is going to be part of the United States. And domestic funders need to start acting as if it will be. And recognizing the amazing opportunities that are that, that exist there and how much their investments, how far those investments can go. As Janice said, a little bit of grant money in Puerto Rico goes a long way. And I think that any um, justification that can be made to a board, all you need to do is focus on that. This kind of investment will go a long way. Thank you, Arturo. Um, Nelson, so very happy to have you here. Um, Nelson is the president and CEO of the Puerto Rico Community Foundation, so I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, and, and thank you all. all. Uh, this conversation in itself, it's, um, it's really moved the needle a little bit further uh, just by having it. And um, I want to thank you all for that. I want to thank Janice. Uh, Janice, quite frank, frankly, for the first time, I, I have heard a presentation that summarizes so well, and in such a short time, the situation <laughs> of Puerto Rico. We spent hours and hours and hours <laughs> going around it. Sure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow you. <laughs> Any, anyway, um, uh, uh, two or three thoughts. Uh, one is um, uh, when when the government is, is creating its uh, its economic strategy, and we need to think in terms that basically uh, this is a government going into bankruptcy. It is not a people going into bankruptcy. So we need to separate separate those two. People keep on living, working, thriving. Um, so when we look at that strategy. Uh, basically depends on one tax incentives to attract uh, external capital uh, and secondly tourism uh, we have gone through that road several times in the past uh, the challenge is that the windows open the window the windows close um, so what we haven't looked at seriously and that's where I see the opportunity for uh, philanthropic strategies is locally based economy. Uh, so when you look at the countries that are growing, thriving, expanding, they have very strong locally based uh, economy. Uh, uh, Dominican Republic, Panama, Vietnam, all of them have, have Singapore, all of them has a very strong locally based economy and the government of Puerto Rico has to recognize yeah, that the locally based economy Economy is another economic engine. I'm not saying it's the only one, but it's a very powerful economic engine. And uh, uh, in fact, the same thing happened in Colombia. And they decided purposefully to focus on locally based economy to make the economic uh, grow. So uh, as, as uh, Janice, was, was say, Janice was saying, uh, there is an opportunity for philanthropic investment along those lines, but also there is um, a very active, active philanthropic tool that we haven't seen being used in Puerto Rico, and that is um, economic and financial investment for economic growth. Uh, and what I, what I mean by that is um, those groups in Puerto Rico involved in job creation. 
uh, involved in uh, 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 microenterprise acceleration, uh, they want financing. And the reason they are asking for financing is a grant is good, but every grant has an ending horizon, and they know it. You give me 10 million now, I, next year, I have to go out and look for 10 million. There, therefore, there is a, a dynamism attached to financial investment, and in our conversations with the, uh, the economic development, development uh, groups in Puerto Rico, they're really hungry for uh, uh, financial uh, investment with, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, non, in non-commercial terms. However, uh, even if there is a return and if there is a yield, and, 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 and there are, uh, you know, some interest in social and financial return on, on, on investment. So uh, that is one side that I really invite you to look at, and that is the, the potential of investing in Puerto Rico uh, as a sort of a, uh, a, 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 dyna a, a dynamic mechanism to, to make it happen. Uh, secondly, um, I think when you look at housing in Puerto Rico, uh, there is an, ex an excess, uh, one, how many minutes? One. One. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is an excess of, of housing units in the, in the bank's inventory. However, there is a need of affordable housing. And uh, uh, locally based uh, affordable housing organization has produced around 6,000 housing units for Puerto Rico. So that is another fertile ground. I cannot um, escape from the status uh, question. Uh, so that is not on my minute, that's on your minute. Uh, I put it out there. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I, 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 I think that um, in, in, in whatever status um, option uh, Puerto Rican decides, we need to be a productive country. I mean, uh, there is no way. Uh, I mean, you can you cannot change status with having a labor participate uh, participation rate of only uh, 40 40 percent of your labor mm -hmm. force. So you need we need to to look very seriously at that in terms of having a serious um, uh, conversation. But in terms of domestic and international, um, you know, the question is where your border is, and it, it, whatever falls into your border. Uh, that's domestic. That is a very, I mean, you can go into much more uh, technical uh, definitions, but um, Puerto Rico is a non incorporated territory and so on. But you look at the US borders uh, and you have one on the north, you have another one on the south, and that one on the south is Puerto Rico. It's not Florida, <laughs> it's Puerto Rico. <laughs> uh, so, um, and just, 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 just to finish, um, in the 90s, uh, we established a program in Puerto Rico, Senat, Larry, you reminded me of this, that it mirrored El, El Puente. It was established in, in Guadalajara. Uh, so there is a, a lot of gains in terms of these uh, interactions, connections, and conversations. So I thank you very much for that. Thank you, Nelson. So I think it's a perfect segue uh, to Jose Garcia, in part because you were talking a lot about locally based economy. And um, and Jose is a program officer at the Cerdner Foundation and the Strong Local Economies Portfolio. So I think his understanding and his um, really expertise in this area it serves as a perfect segue. So Jose, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah. Thank you, um, and thank you for the panelists that were just um, presented. I, I just want to make four points. Um, I, I think that, uh, as we know, the, the issue of the crisis in Puerto Rico is not something that happened yesterday, right? That this is something that has been brewing due to uh, political, not only political, but clearly an economic development policy that actually have been not being addressed. Um, and the issue of its debts could be corrected. Therefore, the correction of its debts will be corrected. And as we think of funder, I think it's important to understand that the importance, I think, of investing in Puerto Rico, but you can invest in the United States and invest in Puerto Rico, right? They're in critical role of the federal government that should, that can play here, right? Uh, clearly, and uh, not only invest uh, in the fed in the federal government to help Puerto Rico to actually deal with the issue of bankruptcy. It's a critical step to help the island. 
and U.S. funders. I think Larry, I think a very important point around the role of Florida, but I will add the whole north, northeast of the United States, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in which Puerto Rican play a critical role in critical cities uh, uh, in these areas for, for political um, acumen of any, any type of country, which is extremely important. Uh, the other point that I would like to make is that the Puerto Rican political limbo as has been defined not necessarily means a uh, philanthropic limbo, right? Uh, we have, you know, you can invest in Puerto Rico as you can invest in any city in the United States. Uh, so therefore, that doesn't mean, and the critical role, I mean, if you, we talk about the Puerto Rican diaspora, the critical role that the Puerto Rican population have played in the history of this country and the strong connection to this country, make it so part of the, not only as citizens, but clearly of the construction of the American uh, American concept of what is to be an American. And I think that's an important tool to be uh, understanding in that in that role. And it's important role as a Latino population, right? I mean, I think that the Puerto Rican not only are the second largest Latino population in the United States, and the critical leadership role that they play in, in the heat of Congress, and we I think we have seen it one time, time and again, how Puerto Ricans in, the, in Puerto Rico have been able to leverage their power, not only for US issues, but issues of the island, and a critical role that I think environmental funders know here is the issue of Vieques, for example. Um, how, assisting the process of stopping actually one of the most powerful, right, military uh, conglomerate uh, uh, powers in the United States and stop it from bombing an important island to stop cancer, right, and others. And that is not only the play of Puerto Rican in Puerto Rico, but also the play of the Puerto Rican diaspora. Yeah. Um, understanding that I think is extremely important. And the fourth point I think uh, I will make that the clear of investment, and I think um, Nelson made a great point, and it's important. This is uh, uh, investing in Puerto Rican communities, right, uh, and creating the community, the economic apparatus, right, to be able to grow not only neighborhood economics but also cities and the nation's economy. It's extremely important to how the Puerto Rican Puerto Puerto Rican people can actually move forward and philanthropy with PRI dollars and other grant investments, right, mm -hmm. and changing economic policy. Uh, a system change, investing in that in that infrastructure can be critical to actually move the, the, the island forward and critically also how the island goes, certain cities of the United States go. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an important role. We're talking about Hartford, Connecticut, Springfield, Massachusetts. We're talking about Orlando, Florida, or, uh, and New York City. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And last, but definitely not least, uh, Jerry Maldonado, uh, Senior Program Officer at the Ford Foundation. So thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks to EGA and Philanthropy New York for hosting this. I mean, I think the last, the, the initial panel did a fantastic job at framing some of the big challenges, right, facing the island, not just the island, and mainland Puerto Ricans. There are challenges of inequality and exclusion and challenges of transparency and accountability. Um, and I think what is powerful, and I think, Janice, you said this, is out of every crisis, there are moments of opportunity. And so I think that when we were on the learning tour last fall, we were we came away quite inspired by the amount of innovation on the ground, right? Um, the real way in which communities, local communities, are reimagining how you build communities, how you build local environments, right? Um, and the significant challenges to scaling those opportunities, right? Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and about kind of the need for more coordinated public, private, and philanthropic action, right? To really take these hubs of innovation and bring them to scale. I'd say the first thing, and I think Elizabeth, you mentioned this kind of in your intervention, was kind of the need for more coordinated investment in civic capacity, right, to shape local national development challenges uh, and policy. And so I think that, Jose, you mentioned it, that the challenges that the island faces are long-term structural challenges that have been decades in the making, right? And the challenge in addressing those long-term structural economic challenges is that they've been highly politicized. They've been tied to the specific parties. Every party has an economic agenda that's tied to uh, a political option. And that's where the status then complicates the debate, right? So that there is a fundamental need, and I think this is what OSF is trying to build, a space, right, for kind of autonomous civil society not tied to the political party system, right, to engage in honest, robust deliberation <laughs> around kind of the future of the island based on kind of perspectives, ideas, and models that are rooted in the ground up, right? And that are not necessarily tied to specific, you know, status options, right? Because I think that is another way to, to get to the fundamental challenges of status without starting there and without starting a highly politically kind of charged environment. 
And so that there is a critical need, and I think that OSF's kind of investments, right, in beginning to build that with journalists, with lawyers, is a really kind of critical investment. And I think it's a piece of the conversation that many of us have continued to have following the tour, right? How do we build, so OSF is, for example, building some national infrastructure. How does that connect to specific place-based organizing and advocacy, right? We saw three examples, only three, there are many, many more, right? And I think you all can point to many, many more kind of successful examples around different issues, right? We saw a specific slice related to housing and, and, um, and environment. There are folks who are organized around education and youth. And so there's a real opportunity, right, for thinking about how we build that more robust advocacy and organizing infrastructure. And the challenge is that because national U.S. philanthropy doesn't see Puerto Rico, right, it is invisible in many ways, right, that infrastructure is critically underfunded, right? And so that's the first thing, I think, in terms of an opportunity. I think the second piece goes to this question of leveraging and aligning public, private, and philanthropic resources, right? And I think um, you mentioned this note, so in terms of, you know, the need for kind of building on a, a new kind of local economic development model, right? And I think while I agree that there are really interesting examples of kind of local micro business, there is this broader national challenge of scaling that up. It will be impossible to scale up those micro businesses in a macroeconomic context, right? Where the entire kind of national economy is in meltdown mode, right? And so that there is a need for both kind of coordinated advocacy, technical assistance, kind of financial at multiple levels across the island, right? And I think that this, I think, ties to kind of the, the issue of the diaspora, right? Which is really, really critical. And, I, and Larry, thank you for kind of bringing that up because I think that it was always frustrating to me is that the issues of the diaspora and the island are typically seg segregated, right? And so you can deal with the island or you deal with Puerto Ricans here. And the reality is that the fates of both communities are fundamentally intertwined. Jose, to your point, there will be no solution to the fiscal crisis, right, unless Puerto Ricans on the main line are actively engaged and activated, right, <laughs> to, to make a, a resolution kind of happen, right? Um, there will be kind of no kind of new development paradigm if Puerto Ricans on the, on the mainland and the island don't really kind of negotiate something. And so I think that there is an opportunity to really mobilize. I think there are really specific political opportunities with Florida, with kind of New England. And I think that this was also represented by some of our grant, the, 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 um, the groups on the ground. Some of the groups are facing really specific challenges linked to kind of federal policy and action, right? Whether it's kind of the dredging of the canal and the lack of resources, right? So those resources will not be attained, right? If there's not kind of more direct advocacy, right? Um, and again, I think Puerto Ricans on the mainland can play a critical role. And the third piece is really supporting the collective voice of philanthropy. And I'm gonna end there, right? Because I think philanthropy, mainland and island philanthropy have a real opportunity to create the convening spaces that help set the agenda, right? So again, because many of these issues are so highly politically charged, we can create that space, right? That creates cover, right? Among the different players to engage in conversations around the future of the cities of, of the island's kind of economic development paradigm, right? Around climate change. Um, and I think that we also have a kind of critical role in leveraging different financial instruments. Many of us invest in direct grants, we have PRI, so the question is how are those kind of investments aligned? Um, and how do we, you know, how do we forge a common voice? So there's a whole kind of communication strategy also that I think philanthropy has a potential role to play. So I'll pause there. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. That very impassioned um, uh, ending to the, <laughs> um, uh, of, of the responders. So I think we're ready to open it up um, for to questions. Um, and, and I'd say it's to questions to the responders, so Arturo, Nelson, Jose, and Jerry, as well as Larry, to Janice, to me, and to Elizabeth. So there's a, there's a bunch of folks here to answer questions or to, to help us think. And so if there are no questions, um, to really sort of spur conversation and to help us think about, about what you've heard, what we saw, and the opportunities that exist on the island. And we'll bring the mic around so the folks on the live stream can hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question for Leticia. Uh oh, you have a question <laughs> for me? Okay. Yeah, because you, you, you mentioned affinity groups. and. Um, you know, I'm relatively new to the philanthropic community, only about a year and a half or so. And uh, there's a lot of affinity groups. There, I think there's more than 40, um, perhaps even approaching 50. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about a strategy going to what Jerry said about creating spaces and convenings. 
of, of how we can bring the issue of Puerto Rican opportunities and Puerto Rican needs into the affinity groups in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's definitely something, a dialogue that uh, people like those convening around the table here uh, could probably um, mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I, I definitely think it's important. I think the challenge, and, and maybe Jerry and Jose being part of Neighborhood Funders Group can speak to this as well, um, is, you know, how part of it is a representation issue, right? And so oftentimes some of it comes in with NFG, and I can't speak to that, like the diaspora, right? Those of us that are in philanthropy, that are in these affinity groups saying, hey, putting a light on what we believe is happening and the importance of the issue. Um, but I think some of it will be, what are the interests also of the funders on the island to be part of this conversation? Whether it's, you know, we, you know, we can start naming them, there's so many. Um, you know, whether it's EGA or some of the other groups, you know, it's really important, I think, for the voice of funders on the island to be part of that conversation. So it isn't just, um, you know, Leticia, who is, you know, in the United States saying that we should look at this, but it's also done in collaboration with our colleagues on, on you know, in the island, in the philanthropic community. No, I, so I think that's totally right. I think mm -hmm. fundamentally this is really an organizing challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And I think following the conference, there were two big themes, right, that I know that many of us on the national front were quite interested in following up. And they relate to issues of economy and equity, right? And the equity piece as a whole, you could slice that, right? There are environmental kind of resilience, equity, right? There's kind of the broader accountability, transparency, social justice, infrastructure kind of equity. Those are two big themes that there was a lot of interest and momentum, and we continue to talk with one another to figure out how we best organize ourselves, right? I think, again, the moment, this moment of the island's fiscal crisis represents a significant opportunity, right, for philanthropy to have a much more concerted voice in a resolution, right, and in helping to bring together parties to think about the various kind of um, alternatives to resolve the crisis, right? And I think, so that's one kind of op moment of opportunity, right? Uh, there's also on, around the economy this need for a new development paradigm on the island. Right? Irrespective of status, there is a need to have a new conversation, right? Yeah. And that ties directly to environment, that ties to education, that ties to all sorts of other things, right? So I think on the national side, we kind of at NFG have continued this conversation with our partners at EGA. I think today's event, you know, is a culmination, right, of that initial kind of partnership. And so I think that there is interest, right, among a number of affinity groups who want to kind of move this agenda forward. I think the challenge then arises with our partners, right, on the island, that we cannot carry this conversation, right, alone, right, mm -hmm. and that there is a need to have local funders on the island organized collectively, because just like in the U.S., if Ford leads an agenda, it is Ford's agenda, and that's the mm -hmm. death knell of any agenda. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, and the reality is, on the ground in Puerto Rico, right, there needs to be kind of a collaborative of funders. It cannot be owned by any one foundation, because then that is a death knell. It becomes associated with it. And you always have to get in the same kind of position, right? You guys are leading the charge. And so the question is, you know, moving forward and coming out of this session, uh, it would be great to get a temperature check from yep. folks, right? Yep. To get a sense of, you know, are folks interested in continuing to construct something, right? And continue to identify some very specific kind of activities this year, right? Um, on the mainland and in on the island. I think we need kind of counterparts there, right? Yep. Um, who are able to organize the funders and feed the agenda. So it's not, not you know, U.S. mainland funders dominating and setting an agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I, think, so, I think that's right. Great. So I know, I know that there's a question in the back. So um, maybe state your name and your organization and, and the question. Oh, there's a question Actually, on the live stream. I have All a right. question from yeah. Twitter. <laughs> it works. Um, from <laughs> Michugana. Thank you so much for participating in the conversation via the live stream. Um, he says, with Puerto Rico having a relatively young nonprofit sector, how can our nonprofits compete for these highly competitive dollars since the nonprofits have less funding, more work to do, and more uncertainty overall? Thank you. Janice? Yeah. I just wanted to point out that Puerto Rico's nonprofit sector yeah, right. is, is not relatively new. <laughs> it actually is pretty old. And some of these organizations have been around for quite a long time and have been doing uh, hard and good work for quite a long time. Uh, foundations are not new. Uh, foundations have been around for a long time. I think, uh, Nelson, you all just had a 25th anniversary. 
30th anniversary. And I think Angel Ramos is even older. So they've been around for a long time. Needs have been around for a long time. <laughs> I think what is important to note, and also tying into uh, the conversation just now, is that foundations have been working together in different ways for many years. And around this issue of getting more US funders to pay attention to Puerto Rico, there have been a number of meetings. We had a meeting recently, um, about three weeks ago, uh, where the major grant-making foundations in Puerto Rico have come together to try to develop a joint strategy to approach, uh, uh, not approach, but to, yeah, to invite uh, US funders into a partnership. I actually think that Puerto Rico fell off the map when Puerto Ricans in New York uh, stopped being activists. Isn't that interesting? Talk about the influence of the diaspora. In the 70s and 80s, Puerto Ricans and 90s, Puerto Ricans in New York were very much activists. They would go into foundations. They would go and meet with Franklin Thomas of the Ford Foundation and say, what are you doing for Puerto Ricans, right? And as a result, there were uh, in foundations people who were program officers assigned to issues of Puerto Rican, later became Hispanic. In, in Puerto Rico, there was, uh, in uh, Ford, there was a fellow uh, who passed away, well, William uh, Bill Diaz. Uh, in any case, all of this is to say that there is an active uh, nonprofit sector, that some of them are small because the funding is small, but their agendas are quite large. Proyecto Enlace, which many of you saw, has a huge agenda dredging a channel which costs $385 million to dredge, which can only be done by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Casa Pueblo has a huge agenda. It has a, 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 a sanctuary, a forest that it takes care of uh, in partnership with the government. And many of these organizations have extraordinary leadership and innovative approaches. Uh, the Proyecto Enlace has a very innovative uh, affordable housing or housing for the poor initiative by, uh, in which they've created a fideicomiso, which is a land trust, a community land trust. So these organizations, many of them are ripe for scale up. They're ripe for investing um, and they could have a very important transformative, increasingly transformative impact in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Um, I, I, this is an um, observation. Maybe it's a question if anybody wants to consider it a question. But um, so if Puerto Rico were a state with 4.6 million people and it was a state that had a utility that runs on very dirty oil, which, by the way, not a single state in the United States runs on oil anywhere close to how Puerto Rico does. Um, and that was a utility, utility that is facing financial disaster, uh, including a story in today's, today's Wall Street Journal. Um, there would be foundations that would see that as a possible opportunity to shift from dirty oil to uh, energy efficiency, uh, solar, wind. After all, it's an island that's pretty sunny and pretty windy, so you could probably <laughs> do it. And, um, and that there would be, uh, while there would be job loss issues that would have to be dealt with, there would also be substantial job gain issues and all of that. And to the limited extent that I've had that conversation with funders that if, it, if, if this were, I don't know, Indiana or somewhere, would be in the game, it's, it doesn't get anywhere. It doesn't get anywhere. And I guess I just was wondering for some of um, you who work on issues that are really important as it relates to economic development in Puerto Rico, but not necessarily environmental or climate issues per se, um, what are your thoughts about how we might change that? Some of you know the foundations are, some of you maybe don't, who would be working on, on this kind of thing. But it does seem like it's an important shift that could benefit Puerto Rico itself, uh, as well as one that's important nationally and internationally. And so far, I, I haven't been successful in getting people to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so, um, hi everyone, Claudia Gutierrez and I work for EPA and um, we've been really involved with uh, a lot of the work that's going on in the Caño Martin Peña. But I wanted to add to what Larry said, um, definitely lack of infrastructure, water infrastructure is another issue that we're, we are seriously uh, working on. But definitely looking at those options or how to bring, you know, 50% of the infrastructure is also lacking. And that also adds to climate change, obviously. Um, and on the, on the thought of clean renewable energy, we have had companies that come to Puerto Rico through our Puerto Rico Recycling Partnership that are concerned to setting up shop and creating jobs because of the energy costs. So going back to what you said, definitely investing in clean, clean renewable energy. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is capacity building for grant making. I know grants end, but at some point they help, obviously. And um, we definitely have a challenge there. There's no capacity building for grant for applying for grants. Uh, and so, and then the other the other challenge is co cost sharing. So, um, you know, if if all of you, <laughs> the panelists, can think of the of those options and how to how to you know think of ideas on how do we can. Uh, definitely um, break those barriers. Uh, thanks, Claudia. The other thing that I wanted to say to Larry's point, I wish that I knew this. Um, is the, are the emissions from Puerto Rico and the other uh, outlying territories, are they included in the intended national, um, intended nationally determined contributions for, for climate change that the uh, president just put forward to do you happen to know whether they are included? Well, I think that I'm not answering the question mm -hmm. exactly the way you asked it, but uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but I think that uh, the territories, the um, you know, so it's Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, probably Guam. I don't know anything about Guam. I have to say, but um, are um, included. When it comes to having to do state implementation plans, they do. There, uh, I mean, we have EPA's person here who could tell me if it knows a hundred times more about this than I do. But I think that uh, the uh, current rulemaking uh, that relates to greenhouse gases, um, if that goes forward, Puerto Rico is covered by that, as I understand it. So with respect to air uh, regulations for, for the MATS rules, as everyone knows them, um, mercury air toxic rules, uh, definitely Puerto Rico is not, um, you know, it's going to have challenges in meeting those rules. And you talked about using uh, oil, which 70% uh, of the oil is used in PR. And so definitely a big challenge for us because those rules are here. And the same, you know, the same goes for CO2. So definitely we need to work, you know, we're working with PREPA, but it's going to be very challenging. And I know right now they're looking at the Aguirre plant, and I won't go into more details, um, and hopefully that will come to, to, to fruition. And if it does, then uh, we'll be in a better place, but still a lot of challenges ahead with respect to air rules. Yes. Yeah, part, of, part, of the reason I, I, Larry, part of the reason I asked this question, is that given the fact that Puerto Rico has 4.6 million people, and which makes it far ahead of many other states, I, um, that you know, in terms of the, the investments of the West Coast uh, climate funders, for example, they should examine what the contribution is, relative contribution there, and say it makes more sense, it's big, bigger bang for our buck to invest in dealing with this situation than in, to invest in Wyoming or invest in other places. No, no disrespect to Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I absolutely agree. The one thing, the other thing that I wanted to add is, is the political advocacy. It's really important, and I mm -hmm. and I think it's also lacking mm -hmm. there because we have projects, for example, in New York, um, that Long Island Sound gets tons of money, and why can we get the Caño Dredge? So mm -hmm. there's. I, I just wanted to to say a, a couple of things. Um, uh, one is that. Uh, environment has not traditionally been one of the areas in which Puerto Rico funders have funded. Uh, but I also have to say that neither was transparency, accountability, or <laughs> civic capacity building. 
And when Open Society came to Puerto Rico and made a big investment and said, we can't be in this alone, funders anteed up. And now this Espacios Abiertos initiative has a set of funders who previously did not support any of those things. So this is to say that your funding can also initiate things and get funders to think about new things that they have not been thinking about. So it can create an incentive, I think, in, in the funding uh, community. It, I also wanted to uh, note that recently, President Obama was, I believe, in Jamaica, where he signed a $20 million initiative mm -hmm. to provide alternative energy, funding for alternative energy projects to these islands. Guess what? Puerto Rico was not among them mm -hmm. because it is not the US related islands. It, it are, they are the independent islands. So here is another situation where government money could also provide an incentive, but is not doing so. So just things I wanted to note. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, OK, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just um, just uh, two quick notes. Uh, one is uh, there are 3.5 million Puerto Ricans in Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, 4.5 in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S. Okay, uh, but but that, that I mean that that is, that is basically a, a, a sort of a call for connecting with the diaspora. Um, and secondly, going back to the whole economic engines um, of, of Puerto Rico, tax and the incentive, tourism, energy. Uh, uh, I think that I would reverse, and, and locally based economy, I would reverse uh, the question and ask you, uh, if we were to make a case uh, mm -hmm. about energy in Puerto Rico, what would that case look like? What are, what are the tractions for uh, that case moving forward? What are the key elements here in terms of making that case? OK. Mm -hmm. Solar investment, definitely. Um, but again, you know, we have to deal with the situation of prepa. So yeah, there. So yeah. The, there's got to be a, a, a you know, I, I guess you have to break that barrier there. But. Which, which, by the way, calls, uh, and I, I, I'll mention this quickly, for a different kind of alliances in Puerto Rico. Um, we need to look at labor yeah. unions. We need to look yep. at credit unions as allies with uh, the philanthropic and nonprofit yeah. sector to make things happen. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I would just add, we've been sort of shamelessly trying to create connections among our sites in terms of how they can advance their goals. And um, you know, there's a big solar plant in Buffalo that's getting going, and there are people who are like, well, you have a solar plant in Buffalo, and Puerto Rico has a need, so why not just make those two things happen, which sounds really good. And I think when we've, it's exciting, but we've gone, you know, we've had some folks kind of investigate that. And I, you know, I think they see it as such a risky investment that they're just not like, and so I think it goes back to maybe this diaspora question of like, how do you start creating the will and like helping companies see that maybe there is actually return on investment here? And, and how do they, how do we make that happen? Or how do we use a PRI or something to sort of catalyze that? But I guess I just want to say that this is not an abstract question because what there is going to be something worked out with PREPA. Um, it's not going to be that, I mean, I don't know what's going to be worked out. But one of the things that could be worked out, just so we understand, is that these plants run forever and they just don't have their debt. Uh, you know, they have a, a lot of their debt is written off. They run for a really long time. They're dirty and there are very few jobs associated. And if that's what happens, it, nobody's going to connect solar manufacturing in Buffalo to whatever the theoretical need might be in Puerto Rico. And so, without so that there are and there are people, uh, you know, who are if are do work in the 50 states who really could probably figure out how would you have a practical way of substantially shifting the electricity sector in um, Puerto Rico from dependence on oil overwhelmingly to dependence to a substantial extent on things that we all like better and unless foundations that focus on on this that have substantial amounts of money 
get into the game quickly. I think that's not what's going to happen. I think what's going to happen is bad power plants will just keep running, and it doesn't matter how many times you know uh, uh, the Obama administration or its successor uh, uh, promulgate new regulations, it'll still be what happens. And so, so this is something that's relatively immediate for reasons that aren't necessarily because anybody's you know, being a bad person, but just for all the reasons that we know about, Puerto Rico just kind of isn't really on the radar screen for most of those uh, foundations. And there is a challenge for all of us, and I'm happy to talk to people about it afterward, mm -hmm. as to how do we get Puerto Rico on the radar screen? Because I think, I'm so, OK, it's only 3.5 million people as opposed to 4.5, but still, it's a lot of people. Yeah. And it's a lot of em a lot emissions. Lot Wyoming. Yeah. And, it, it, and, and it ought to, um, and it ought to change, and, it, and we're probably in a moment where it could change, but eventually that moment will pass. Yeah. So I, I'd like, so Jose, just very quickly. So, so this idea of, of and we, we don't have to answer it necessarily right now, but I think it's come up a number of times, this idea of how do you activate the 4.5 million people mm -hmm. and voices that are part of the Puerto Rican diaspora here, right? So to your point, in terms of Long Island Sound or Wyoming, and again, nothing against Long Island Sound or Wyoming, but I think it's mm -hmm. sort of important um, to to bring up this issue, that, right? This is an advocacy issue. It's an organizing issue, and and for us to think about, I'd, I'd love, you know, I'd love to end meetings with sort of what is the next step, or the, what what are the action steps? Not that we necessarily here um, have to. Everybody has to be involved in it, but I think it's an, it's important to to put it out into the universe that this idea of advocacy and really activating right the Puerto Rican diaspora like what what does that look like what does it take mm -hmm. and what are how, what are the what are the thoughts around making that happen so i know it's a big question i i don't expect all the answers now maybe later <laughs> um, but jose sorry i interrupted you no, i the, think okay. larry to your point i think the the 100 or 700 pound gorilla right is the role of the state in which we have a, a state that it's, uh, it's largely trouble uh, in Puerto Rico. And the importance, therefore, to see, I think, the piece of advocacy becomes extremely important, in which we can get, you know, if we think about a way of getting federal uh, or U.S. diaspora and Puerto Ricans from the island actually coalesce around this issue of bankruptcy law in the island and structure the debt in a way that doesn't take strip the assets from the island, is a critical question. We're talking about 20 per, close to 20% of the islands that it, it's, it's owned by hedge funds, right? And they're not usually have the best uh, intentions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if we're able to do that, um, and I think it's, it's an important first step. The second thing I will add, and, and you know, I, I'm big into economic development and how do we actually create sustainable economic development, but if we create a robust uh, if civic infrastructure, things like Enlace, Casa Pueblo, that actually start lifting those voices, not only on their issues, but actually how to imagine a different way of doing business in the island. It's a critical component, I think, of that, of, of investment, I think, on the island. And I think we clearly have to get to the point that you're talking about in terms of, how, you know, PREPA and, and other critical components of sustainable energy sources in the island. But I, I think... I think this issue of, of, of the economic crisis is an important step. So was, was there a question over here? And I see Sol, Sol's hand. Sure. OK, OK. This is actually not a question. This is because, Leticia, you actually said what I was thinking when I heard um, I channeled all of the you. panelists. You did. <laughs> and I channeled you. Um, this connectivity issue and how to engage um, the diaspora and Puerto Ricans here um, was exactly what I was thinking. And it seems, you know, the philanthropic sector, and I'm really so excited that, um, you know, powerful and influential foundations are thinking about this. But I do think that there's a need for us to consider, you know, a table that includes um, nonprofits that we can provide money and, you know, convening, et cetera, et cetera, some influence. But the nonprofit sector here in the United States, as well as in PR, they're the ones that are mobilizing folks. They're the ones that are, you know, getting people engaged, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that in terms of as a next step, that has to be, we have to start thinking about how we are partnering with them, mm -hmm. providing resources there as well as providing resources in PR, bringing folks together so that they can be doing here what, what you know, so we can be working in, with with one agenda in mind and you know in one path because otherwise, 
um, you know, they just need to be brought to the table. So yeah. I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. In the black, yes, sweater, mm -hmm. shirt. So um, to this point about, you know, raising the profile with the diaspora and making those connections, have you all been engaging? I'm sure you have, but what's the best way or some ideas to leverage institutions? You know, obviously, I'm from an institution right here down the street uh, with lots of resources. Um, and I'm sure there's other universities that have engaged with Puerto Rico uh, in many different ways. But how do you leverage and also coordinate some of that activity that's happening uh, within the intellectual space to best help and support the work that's ongoing on the ground and through philanthropy, making those connections? And maybe there's a way that you know institutions, like academic institutions, can help make those connections between the diaspora and what's happening on the ground in Puerto Rico. Maybe there's other ways, um, like innovations um, and eco, you know, and tourism and energy uh, or public policy. But you know, it'd be great to get some ideas about how to best leverage those resources. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, you know, <laughs> in response to your question and what Sol and Jose talked about, I, I I agree that these structural issues are. They have to be addressed. They have to be dealt with. I do think, however, that, that energy is another example of a structural issue that has to be dealt with. And if there's a window of opportunity that's opening up to deal with it, we should take advantage of it. So it gets to the notion of having sort of a multi-layered uh, agenda or strategy because the group of funders that would be interested in a solar economy initiative on the island that looks at a variety of things, looks at the bunker power, looks at electric cars, Honestly, we have a, a car culture that was in, imported onto the island from the United States, and it's destroying the island in various ways. And we have this window of opportunity that we, electric cars, a current generation of electric cars, could do everything that's needed to be done on the island in terms of travel on one charge. And that's just this generation. The next generation of cars is going to be even better. So I think this, this notion of, of coming up with with areas uh, that will bring in people that are interested in that area um, is something we should explore. Because the funders that are going to focus on those structural issues that Jose brought up are not necessarily going to be the same funders that are going to be focusing mm -hmm. on a solar economy initiative. Yeah, agree. Um, so the one thing I want to mention, and I, I, I really want you to think about this, that clean uh, renewable energy is just not, you know, all the, we all we all know the benefits, but the other big issue in Puerto Rico is public health. Asthma rates are one of the highest in the country, and we need to think about those things when we talk we talk about solutions for clean renewable energy. And then the other thing, to your point, um, Arturo, is that tax incentives. It takes political will. Puerto Rico could give tax incentives to all to all these options. So I think that those things need to be brought up too. And, and Nissan and Prepa signed an, an MOU where they exempted electric cars from the excise tax, which makes those cars, I think, 20 to 30 percent cheaper than a comparably priced uh, internal combustion engine vehicle. Mm -hmm. I Jerry? Wonder, mm -hmm. To your point, I mean, I think. <laughs> so, so I think that there are multiple kind of agendas that have been talked about, right? And the question is, you know, how do we kind of divide and conquer <laughs> in a coordinated way, right? <laughs> so, so there's this question of um, kind of green infrastructure, kind of renewable energy, right? Um, environment and economy, that there is a moment, right? I, I feel like we need someone to organize that conversation, right? Um, and I think I, I would ask. Rachel, you know, <laughs> think about like what role EGA might be able to play, right? And helping us both not just identify kind of the funders in the US, but then who are some of our partners on the ground. So again, Casa Pueblo, for example, is thinking about, you know, kind of solar energy and mm -hmm. how you scale this up, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have allies on the ground in Puerto Rico, right? And I would then defer to our partners on the island, right? To identify who are the right kind mm -hmm. of either funders who might be sympathetic mm -hmm. or kind of nonprofit partners who could lead a conversation. Right, we have key allies in the public sector there who should be part of this conversation. So, so I would say that would be one piece, right? There's this second piece around kind of civic infrastructure, right? Um, and Elizabeth, I'm thinking about again, this is a big piece that OSF 
is really right. I think that the agenda would have to be expanded to talk about not just civic infrastructure on the island, but in the US, right? And tied to a very proactive integrated civic engagement strategy, right? So I think that, you know, there are ways we can invest in kind of diaspora communities that could advance multiple kind of agendas simultaneously. So that would be kind of a second piece. Third, I mean, the 500 pound grill is the bankruptcy. Right. Um, and, you know, there, um, so I think this is where labor is also critical, right? Absolutely. Labor here in the U.S. is leading those some of those conversations yeah, now. So it would not be a question of us organizing that, but us following that, adding our collective voice and figuring out how we could kind of add kind of neutrality and expertise mm -hmm. to the extent that they need it, right? Mm -hmm. I think we have experts within our networks. Then the last piece is, you know, these are all big things. It's all just to have pilots, <laughs> specific things that we can look at. And here I would raise one of the specific examples that we saw in Puerto Rico um, in LASE and the Martin Peña Caño, right? To say there is a very specific example, right, of a community that is having, you know, that has the potential to demonstrate what development could look like, right, is running to some very specific federal kind of policy advocacy. This is with the Army Corps of Engineer, right, specifically around kind of the acceptance of a report and release of the dollars, there is a really specific advocacy opportunity and there's a capacity building opportunity. So I think to the extent that, and I think each of us around this table are interested in different pieces of the agenda, uh, to the extent that we can take on different pieces in a coordinated way with folks leading, but having a space where we can share some of those strategies mm -hmm. would be incredibly powerful. I don't have an answer for that, but I think this is where both an EGA, NFG, kind of, you know, figuring out other community groups, right, take on different pieces of that agenda could be very helpful. So that's kind of my... <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Jerry, and everyone for, for your support to Puerto Rico and to our challenges, because there are so many more challenges that, as um, Claudia mentioned, we are not discussing here and that are going on. And um, as we say in Puerto Rico, se nos va la vida. So we're like really just trying, struggling and trying to bring resources to the table to work with those. Um, but I was going to say that at a minimal at a small scale, I've been trying to in, set up informational sessions with the diaspora. They are all in, all in support whenever we bring issues to the, to, you know, before them. They all, I feel like they, their commitment is there. They're just waiting for, for us to, to provide the resources and the how, when, where, mm -hmm. and they will be there. So just to let you know that that's currently happening, and I see that the ground is very fertile in that sense. The, the community is still an activist community. Um, and I know it was way more active before, but it's still very, very active. And, and the, the community leaders are just waiting for us to give them all the, the data, data points for them to move forward. Um, one example is the Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rican National Day Parade which is actually going to happen this um, in, on June 12. And it's something that really calls the attention of many Puerto Ricans for different reasons um, and nationally. And they will actually be um, dedicating the parade to the struggles of the Martin Peña Channel community. Um, and this is something, this is a huge achievement. And just to give you some, you know, um, ideas of, on, on how this is progressing. I think it's, it's going to move forward. Um, so if we sit down and, and evaluate all of those different elements that are moving um, in support of the Caño Martín Peña, we can develop a very strong uh, platform. And then from there, you feel like, you know, you evaluate whether or not you, sh you, you feel like compelled or you have the resources or your board is on board to support us um, in this particular um, fight uh, because it's a real fight and we're having conversations at different levels with the federal government, congressional leaders, um, and also community leaders. And, and this is happening. Um, it's just a matter of, of, of finding um, additional support. Yeah, and I think, you know, to that point, that's actually a conversation that Jose, Jerry, and I have been very involved in and having Caña Martin Peña as part of of the Puerto Rican Day Parade, we, we sort of dreamt that up actually during the during our tour, right? Like, how on do you the canal, the <laughs> on the canal actually? Um, so the idea was, how do we use this national platform, right, to bring um, to identify social justice issues on the island in a way that that 
the Puerto Rican Day Parade can can only do, right? There, there's lots of great things, there's other things, but, but that it, it is this national and potentially sometimes international platform, right, that, that highlights, has a potential to highlight issues. And so this idea of how can we have the parade really talk about El Caño and do it in a way that's educational and do it in a way that's timely um, is something that I'm, you know, we're really excited about in part because it was this little thing that we thought of like, what about the Puerto Rican Day Parade mm -hmm. as an ally here? But I, but I do think, and we're, we're at time, um, that this question to, you know, which I think was a great point, Brenda, like how do we galvanize? Right? How do we, what are the mechanisms, who are the folks that the diaspora needs to understand, to look to, to help um, you know, bring some political will and advocacy here um, in, you know, in the United States to, 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 to put a, a, a magnifying glass to some extent of what's happening on the island. Um, I don't have the answers, but I think this is really a, a great um, both opportunity for those of us here in the room. And I'm glad to know that the live stream was working. So, so for those that are watching us via live stream, so really um, the passion is here, the advocacy, the the, um, the the what's missing is the political will. And so I think how do we really begin to to turn to focus the attention of both the diaspora and then those folks on the island on so how do we reimagine a future? One of my hashtags, please feel free to use it, on Instagram is, you know, hay otra forma. And so how do we use that um, as potentially, right, not just a hashtag, but really to dream up a new future for, for this island that we all love and care about. Um, so I want to thank everyone. I want to thank Philanthropy New York, EGA, and NFG, Neighborhood Funders Group, for both for the tour, which was amazing, but also for this opportunity for us to all get together and to talk about it, uh, to talk about what we learned and to, to talk about the potential future. Thank you very much. Never know. I know, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, environment, whatever. Jerry, well, you that's, that's why you want to say, why not? <laughs>